garden today. It's an opportunity just to share from God's Word with you. And the environment is lovely. It's quiet. No people around. Avoiding contact. But just a lovely, tranquil setting, may I say. But we miss the fellowship because it's so good to come together. And we should not forsake the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, unfortunately, but exhorting one another even so much the more as we see that day approaching. That day is actually referring to the coming of the Lord Jesus. And we need to be exhorting one another, because these are very difficult days in which we are living. The challenges out there that affects the non-believer and affects the believer, the coronavirus. But we need to take courage. And I think many messages that have that has come through um, our WhatsApp group ha have been very, very encouraging and uplifting messages. And I trust that as I present something to you today, that you will be encouraged. I personally can't encourage you very much, except to take from the good old book and to point you to the Christ of God that this book is about. Because you need to be comforted with the comfort of God. And the Word of God is able to do that. The comfort of the Scriptures, available to us. We thank the Lord for that. At a Bible study last Thursday, or a few Thursdays ago, I shared something from the book of Luke. And I want to start that again today and refer you to Luke chapter 4. In Luke's gospel, a very, very special gospel, uh, Luke, that physician that the scriptures speak about, uh, also gave to us the book of Acts. And we shall get back to the book of Acts a little later on. But for now, Luke chapter 14, I love chapter 4, I beg your pardon. And in chapter 4, we're going to read from verse 18 through to verse 19, perhaps a little further on, verse 21. But the Lord Jesus comes to Nazareth, hometown, and it was custom to go into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. He did that. And he stood up for to read. It's good to having our brethren stand up. Or sisters for that matter. To stand up and to read from the word of God. When we meet together. The Lord Jesus found a place where it was written as follows. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. For he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted and to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. It's a profound statement in the book of Isaiah. And the Lord Jesus, in reading it, is actually reading about himself. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And the Spirit of God came upon the Lord Jesus on that special day when he began to fulfill his ministry. At the age of 30 years, he comes to Jordan's River. John the Baptist had pointed him out as the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And the Lord Jesus wanted to be baptized by John. And John said, no, no, you, you baptize me. The Lord Jesus insisted and he said, Thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. It's, it's the right thing to do, to be baptized in water. Because that's what my Father would want me to do. I come to do the will of my Father. And so he didn't say that, but that was implied. Thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. And he was baptized by immersion in Jordan's River by John the Baptist. When that happened, the Spirit of God came in the form of a dove and rested upon the Lord Jesus, signifying the infilling of the Holy Spirit. 
And there was a voice from heaven which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. So we have the Godhead featuring in that very special moment with the Lord Jesus as he was equipped to go forth and to fulfill his calling. It had not happened before that. It was only from that day onwards that the Lord Jesus was empowered to take the message of the gospel and to fulfill what he actually read in Luke chapter 4, in verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Why? It's very specified for us. It says, to preach the gospel to the poor. There's a message that the people need, my friend. The message of the gospel. And if you want to know something more about the gospel, then if you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, you will read there how that the gospel consists of three vital components, if I can put it like that. And Paul writes and he says in verse 1 of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you received and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, how that which also I received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to to the scriptures and I believe that that's a very important uh, outline of what the gospel is all, all about we, we need to hear that more often uh, we need to hear those core uh, components more in the preaching today because that's the gospel of Jesus Christ by which we are saved. And we need to keep that in memory unless the preaching has been in vain, as we read in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 2. So we even remind the believer about the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me specifically because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. The empowerment came that the Lord Jesus might preach the gospel, which was about himself. He was yet to go to Calvary's cross, but it was about him. And he says then further on, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. There are many like that, friends. Shattered lives, broken hearts. The world is full of such people. Whatever would be their circumstance, whatever would be their hardship and their challenges and their, their shortcomings and their, their, their losses and uh, their um, breakdowns, whatever that might be. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted. The Lord Jesus came to heal the brokenhearted, my friend. To preach deliverance to the captives. How many people are captive out there? Are you captive? There are things that captivate our hearts. Some of those things may be wrong things. Well, we are captured by things that are a problem to us, a problem to our spiritual growth, a problem to us going on with the things of God. Those are weights which should be laid aside. As we're exhorted in the book of Hebrews to um, lay aside every weight and the sin that doth so easily beset us, and run the race with patience. And we look to Jesus, who is the author, and he's the finisher of our faith. But sometimes, you know, you're captivated by weight. Something that stands in the way of you serving the Lord as you ought to. Of course, that would be to the believer that I'm speaking now. But to the unbeliever, the captivations are far more extensive because they are also captivated by sin. And sin has put them into a very special kind of bondage because that is exactly 
what is suggested by being captive. You're in bondage. And many may be in bondage physically in many ways. You know, when you've got a, a, a sickness or disease that perhaps have crippled you, there's, there's a sense in which you're captivated by that sort of bondage because you can't do what others can do. You might even be blind and you're captivated by that kind of bondage and can't do what others can do. But the bondage really would run far deeper than that. It would be the sin-stained heart, number one, that is in bondage. Because it doesn't matter uh, how your physical being might be. Um, you can still serve God. You can still love God. As long as your spirit is free. But bondage often is in the mind. And that troubles us. It's the mind that troubles us. And we are told in the scriptures that we, that the weapons of warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God, to the pulling down of strongholds and casting down of imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. And of course, every thought those many thoughts that are out there that bring us into bondage, that those thoughts we brought into captivity to the obedience of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus came to preach deliverance to the captives. And I want to reiterate the need to preach that. I'm preaching that to you today. That you might be free from that kind of bondage as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you're not a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, the power of God, the power of the gospel is able to bring you out of the bondage that you're in. And if you're not a believer, you're in bondage. Period. That's just how it is. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's not even a single righteous one. And the wages of sin is death. But for the believer, therefore there's no longer condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. Walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. The Lord Jesus has gone on to speak about the recovering of sight to the blind. So there were the many blind physically who couldn't see. And the Lord Jesus gave them sight. He touched their eyes and they were able to see again. Of course the blindness go far more than the physical blindness. Because it's the blindness of the mind, the eye of the mind. We just can't see the truth of God. And the, that curtain is to be drawn aside because the Bible even speaks about the enemy of our souls who um, so blinds our minds lest we believe on the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It says in Second Corinthians and chapter 4 and verse 3, But if our gospel is hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is in the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves. Now we preach Christ Jesus the Lord, the one who took up the book of Isaiah and read from Isaiah these things. We preach him. We preach the Lord Jesus Christ and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. That's what we are, ministers of the gospel, or servants of the gospel. Then it says, For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And as the Lord Jesus lifted up Isaiah and read from it, he was looking into the perfect law of liberty which would speak of himself. So, an encouragement to know that um, the verse that follows that verse I've just read from Second Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6 it says but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency I love that word what a strong word how, how, how majestic is that word because it reminds me of the unsearchable riches of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, it reminds me of his greatness and of his omnipotence and it says we have this treasure 
treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. You don't have the power, I don't have the power. But we are careful that we don't think that we have the power, but we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. And he empowers us with his Holy Spirit so that we might be his witnesses, that we may declare the message of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ in power and in the demonstration of the Spirit of God, not by human wisdom, but by the wisdom which comes from above. The Lord Jesus preached this message from the book of Luke, uh, book of Isaiah, and spoke of the recovering of sight to the blind and to set at liberty them that are bruised. There's a bruising that takes place, that occurs. Um, we have that in life, bumps and bruises, eh? But there's a bruising which is in the heart and in the mind too. And the Lord is able to liberate those that have this bruising. Whatever its nature might be, doesn't matter. The Lord Jesus is able to set you at liberty. I, I love the references to, to the fact that there is the healing, there is the deliverance, there is the recovering, there is the liberating of them that are bruised. How all-embracing is that? That's what the Lord Jesus does for us and has done for us and will do for any who would but believe. And then to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And then the Lord Jesus closed the book. He gave it again to the minister and he sat down and the eyes of all them were, that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. What a remarkable moment for those that were gathered together in the synagogue and to hear the Lord, hear the Lord Jesus speak like this of himself. I want to refer you to another verse of scripture and please if you have a Bible you can follow the reading in the scriptures. It's to be found in John chapter 15 verse 16 and this is the abiding chapter that we've been dealing with quite a lot in recent times. We need to abide in the Lord Jesus Christ and we need to have his word abide in us. He makes a statement to this effect without me you can do nothing. You're not going to get anywhere without the Lord Jesus Christ. It's all about him. As you read from the book of Isaiah, it was all about him. Luke writes in chapter 4, where this is recorded for us, it's all about him. John 15, 16 says this, You have not chosen me, but I've chosen you, and ordained that he's appointed you, that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain and that whatever you shall ask of the Father in my name he may give it to you. It's a remarkable scripture from John chapter 15 verse 16. We, are, we have been ordained, appointed to bring forth fruit. When you are a believer and the Lord Jesus Christ is in you, your, your name may not be in a church register, but it certainly will be recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life. Not just that, the Lord knows your name personally because he speaks as the shepherd to the sheep. And I'll refer to this later on again. He says, my sheep hear my voice. I know them. And they follow me. Yep, we need to follow the Lord. He that cometh after me, well, what does the Lord Jesus require? Let him deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. That's discipleship. John 15 says, I've chosen you and ordained you that you should bring forth fruit and that that fruit should remain. 
What is significant about this verse is that the ordaining is of the believer who is actually abiding in the vine. Um, and it's not that you will um, need to go somewhere in order to bring forth fruit. But he does say here that you need to go and bring forth fruit. And I want to separate the two thoughts. First of all, if you are abiding in the Lord Jesus Christ, as John 15 teaches us, which is, by the way, a very important chapter in the Bible, we need to get eclipsed with what John 15 teaches about the Lord Jesus being the true vine. And um, he then says there in verse 4, Abide in me and I in you. He says, As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except you abide in me. You can't bring forth the fruit that the Lord Jesus is talking about unless you're in him, because he is the vine, and you are the branch, and you will naturally bring forth fruit that would not be your fruit, it would be his fruit that would be shown in your life as a branch and that is the whole appeal of um, the the vine uh, it's to bring forth fruit so a branch isn't fruit but the branch bears fruit and so consequently that fruit requires the branch to be in the vine so that um, the fruit that is produced may be said to be the fruit of the vine. It says, I am the vine, verse 5, and you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. So if you are abiding in him as a branch, you bring forth fruit. That's a natural outworking of the principle of life that is within me. I know that you have the life of Christ in you, because I can see by your fruit. By their fruits you shall know them, the scriptures teach us. And so, if I would want to determine whether someone is a Christian believer or not, then I would be on the lookout for fruit in the life of that, that particular believer. And what sort of fruit are you expecting? Um, are you expecting the man to um, have an entourage following him as those that have been led to the Lord by him uh, at and some sort of early stage in his life? Um, or uh, is it something else? Well, I want to suggest to you that the fruit that is referred to there is the fruit of the Spirit, not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit doesn't bring forth fruit, but the Holy Spirit does baptize us into the Lord Jesus Christ. And the fruit is the fruit of Christ, as Galatians 5 teaches us. And it speaks of the works of the flesh. And then it speaks of the fruit of the Spirit. In verse 22 it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance against such there is no law if we live in the spirit let us also walk in the spirit uh, so that's quite a powerful statement but it tells us what the nature of the fruit is that can be expected from being in the Lord Jesus Christ the fruit of the spirit of Christ fruits of righteousness the Lord Jesus, um, however, in John 15, verse 16, uh, makes it clear that we have been ordained to something. As believers, we are already bringing forth the fruit of Christ in our lives. As I've chosen you and ordained you, that you should go and bring forth fruit. You may feel, well, okay, that's the fruit that we are talking about. Well, you don't have to go anywhere to bring forth that fruit. It's a natural outworking. It, it is there. But the going forth and to bring forth fruit in my own heart, you might have a different persuasion, but my own heart 
correspond so much with the commission of the Lord Jesus that is referred to in the book of Matthew chapter 28 and Matthew chapter 28 does succinctly circumscribe what it is that we should be doing uh, as the believers who have experienced the, the Christ of God and are now indwelling in the Christ of God and he's indwelling them and the commission of the Lord Jesus is in Matthew chapter 28, of course the other Matthew, other Gospels rather also contain it, but specifically he says, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. That is in verse 18 of chapter 28 and he's speaking to his disciples. And he says then, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Verse 19, go ye therefore. So there's the go. Go and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Big question, has the end of the world come? No, it doesn't come. Uh, well, what should we do? Uh, should we have some sort of methodology um, and some sort of program? Because there are many like that available in the bookstores what point you should follow when it comes to preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to the masses. There's nothing like turning to the Word of God where it says, go. Go and teach all nations. Of course, if you read the other Gospels and I don't have time to do it now, what do you do? Well, you go and you preach the gospel to every creature. What is the nature of the gospel? I've already outlined the gospel concerns the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. We want to hear that in the preaching that takes place in our own midst. And, okay, and then so we preach the gospel. What else does it entail? It entails the need to repent. Repentance and remission of sins. You repent and you turn from self. You turn from whatever else it is that you're engaged in. You turn to the living God. And you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And you receive him into your heart and into your life as your own personal saviour. Standing at the door of your heart, as it were, knocking, wanting to come in. You have a door to your heart. The, the, the handle is on the inside, they often say. You open the door, he'll come in. And sup with you and you with him. And you'll have one of wonderful fellowship. And that will be giving an understanding of the abiding of the branch in the vine. And that is just a wonderful relationship to have. But it goes further than that. Uh, you will then bear fruit. But there is a commission that comes your way. Go and all the world. Preach that gospel that saved you to every creature. Um, and repentance, remission of sins is the heart of that. And these signs shall follow them that believe, the Lord Jesus said. And I'm not going to go into that right now. But he says also that they need to be baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And then you teach such to observe all things whatsoever ever I've commanded you. What would the Lord Jesus command his disciples? What would he be teaching them? Well, I do not believe he'll be teaching them anything less. And perhaps, if I could put it like this, and nothing more than what his Father because the Lord Jesus in John chapter 17 speaks of this and he says in John 17 and in verse 8 I have given them the words which thou gavest me and they have received them and have known surely that I came out from thee and they have believed that thou didst send me I pray for them I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. And all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And then it says, And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to thee, Holy Father, keep 
through thine own name those whom thou hast given me that they may be one as we are. Powerful words. Verse 14. I have given unto them thy word and the world hated them because they are not of the world even as I am not of the world. Verse 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And even as, as thou hast sent me into the world, even so I've sent, also sent them into the world. Neither pray for these alone, verse 20, but I pray for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they may be one as Father, thou art in me and I in thee, and they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And so we have the wonderful context of the Lord Jesus wanting us to preach the gospel to every creature. That gospel that he spoke about, as he quoted from the book of Isaiah in Luke chapter 4 that I read about, preaching that gospel that is able to bring about that wonderful work of deliverance, um, to heal the brokenhearted, deliverance to the captives, recovering of sight of the blind, and to set at liberty them that are bruised. That's the gospel. He came and he preached that. It came from the Father. We have come, we're one in him, and he sends us forth to bring forth fruit through the preaching of that very gospel that is able to bring about such deliverance recovery, liberation, and so forth that we read about. And that that fruit should remain. How does it remain? It's to bring the fruit of your labor. You may sow, you may water, but God will give the increase. And that those that believe would come into the Son's house, into the Church of Jesus Christ, where they can be nurtured and loved and cared for. The same precious word that saves them, the incorruptible seed, the word of God, is that precious word that will keep them. And we have um, a duty to minister to such um, profound truths through God's word that they may be preserved, that that fruit may remain to the glory of God. That's why the Lord Jesus says, Father, keep them, and they can be kept through the continuance of the preaching of the word in the body of Christ. God bless you. Amen.